What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Three and Out YouTube page. I'm John Middlecoff, and we are talking football all day, every day. Make sure you subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends. Let's roll, baby. What is going on, John Middlecoff Three and Out podcast? That's the show. That's me. Uh, OTAs getting underway as the league calls it phase three and all the coaches can be on the field with all the players, including the rookies. So everything is off and running. And obviously some of the big stories is the situation with the quarterbacks. Uh, Tua does not have a contract extension, but he's not going to hold out. He will be in camp under his, uh, his fifth year option, 23.7 million dollars. Trevor Lawrence will be going into his fourth year, and Doug Peterson said something today that's pretty interesting. I, I have some thoughts on both players. We have some other guys uh, that are not showing up, and maybe we'll learn more over the next 24 hours of guys that are quote-unquote no-shows. I wanted to dive in what I think is the most important uh, aspect of these next three, four weeks. You know, some teams practice once on the uh, mandatory one and then just send everyone home or go to the pool or whatever. So it's, it's a fluid situation. How, how long these practices will actually go on for. And then I just, I want to hit on some, uh, some other NFL stories, little things flying around out there that I saw on the internet. But before we dive in, I mentioned this yesterday on uh, the go low podcast, reacting to the PGA championship where Scotty Scheffler got arrested is I I was up early in the morning on Sunday, scrolling Instagram, and I see this video of Brock Purdy handing out beers to George Kittle at the Luke Combs concert. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go to that. So hit up my friends at game time, got taken care of, and I'm headed to Luke Combs here in Glendale in a couple weeks. I'm fired up. And I've used these guys over and over for the last year and a half. I've gone to spring training games. I've gone to an NHL game. I've gone to multiple concerts. Uh, I haven't gone to a comedy show yet, but if you want to go to one, I saw my neighbors like a month ago headed out. They had cocktails in hand, hopping in an Uber, headed to a comedy show. So if you want to go enjoy yourself, go do something fun, get out of the house, game time, do it right now. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use the code John for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account, redeem the code J-O-H-N for $20 off. Download the GameTime app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. You know, Mike Florio on Pro Football Talk, highly successful. I, I, I guess it would be called the blog website. It's like the modern day newspaper. Uh, operates at rapid speed, and he gives his opinions, and I disagree with 90% of them. But his big thing is the price always goes up when it comes to these quarterback contracts. And here's my thing. I would never mind paying a little bit more to know for sure. I would hate giving an astronomical amount of money because we all see these quarterback contracts. They are in a different universe than the rest of the players. Like, When wide receivers get broken off, they get $70 million guaranteed. That's what Devontae Adams, that's what Tyreek Hill got. I've never cared that much about the yearly basis when it comes to your contract. Because that's not how NFL contracts work. This is not basketball. Where when you sign a four-year, $100 million deal, you're basically getting $25 million a year. Every penny is guaranteed or a $200 million deal, or $250 million deal, or whatever money gets handed out in the NBA. We know football contracts don't work like that because there's guaranteed money, there's non-guaranteed money, there's signing bonuses, which are a big, uh, you know, setup to the way these guys get compensated. And when we just saw Jared Goff get $170 million guaranteed, that was the number that mattered to me, not the $53 million. Now, if you do the math, $53 million over the course of several years, you know, it's like three, like he's not going anywhere. <laughs> he is the starting quarterback for the foreseeable future. Safe to say they're not going to pull a Sean Payton, Denver Broncos, 
and cut him if he has a down year. But they have to feel really good about him. Because when they traded for him, their franchise was a joke. Three years later, they have a lead in the NFC Championship. And we're working the 49ers on the road. So Jared Goff has proven, and a couple years ago, one question mark with him is in inclement weather. Now, if I was playing in a freezing cold game, he definitely wouldn't be the first draft pick. But remember a couple years ago in a cold game against Aaron Rodgers in his last game as a Packer? Played pretty well. So his resume is really, really long and has proven for them that he can win playoff games. Not a playoff game, playoff games. 1-2 this year. The thing with Tua is he's obviously been really solid for the Dolphins. He's helped with McDonald, or Mike McDaniel, excuse me, and Tyreek Hill and kind of the crew they have make the franchise relevant and got him to the playoffs back-to-back years. Here's the problem, and this year's a good example. Last year, he was injured, right? He had the concussion concussion situation, didn't even play in the, in the game against the Bills in the playoffs. Skylar Thompson did. Actually, had some moments. And then this year, he had no shot. Like, it was a joke against the Kansas City Chiefs in that freezing cold weather game that Brett Beach told me at the Combine was the coldest game he's ever been experienced. And when you just say it's going to be a freezing cold game, you would short the Dolphins. My thing is on extending him, like, what's the rush? Why do you need to do it? If the number is the number, like, I just can't pay you the number right now. If I'm going to have to pay 10 more percent because this year you take me to the conference championship game, rattle off some playoff victories, win me the division, okay. But I will feel much better against that six-month 10% inflation because I didn't pay him over the summer and I paid him in February or March of 2025 knowing what he can do in the big games. Because right now you simply do not. He was not good down the stretch. He did not beat good teams and he didn't play well. And the team that you're chasing, he's never going to be as good as Josh Allen. So I'm I'm not comparing him to Josh Allen. But that's the guy in your division. Like, that's the guy you have to take down. And there was never a better time than 2023 when the team started 6-6. and And then when the dust settled, they won the division. And obviously, they were in the second round of the playoffs. So my take on guys like Tua is I just need as much information as possible before I'm absolutely forced. That's what I would do. And we'll see if the Dolphins end up giving him a massive extension in even in the Jared Goff range, which I think, like, I would rather have Jared Goff than Tua Tonga Vailoa. I don't think that's some hot take. I think that's kind of a no-brainer. And I think if I polled 32 GMs, I think Goff would be the majority of picks. Not saying it'd be 32 nothing, but I think the number would be well over 25. <laughs> I, I, I think it would be... 90%. I, I I really do. So I, my take on this is just, what's the rush? What's the rush? And I say the same thing about Trevor Lawrence. Because Doug Peterson said today that Trent Baalke and Trevor Lawrence's agent are working tirelessly on a contract extension. Another Florio take. The price only goes up. Okay. At least I feel better about giving 180 or $200 million dollars knowing I have a guy after he throws 35 touchdowns and leads me to the division championship when most people are going to pick the Texans or even the Colts, not us. Trevor Lawrence has never thrown more than 25 touchdowns in a season. And that was two years ago. Last year, he was banged up and simply he just wasn't very good. Turned the ball over way too much. And to me, the eye test, you just watched him. And when you factored in the hype, you're like, I don't see it. Now, if he's the 11th best quarterback and I got to give him some massive contract, so be it. But if it turns out he's actually closer to like the 15th, 16th best quarterback in the league, we got a problem. And now given our division, just with C.J. Stroud and the Houston Texans, we're fighting for second place. And if this year, Shane Sykin's definitely a good coach. And if Anthony Richardson can stay healthy, that roster's really good. All of a sudden, we're finishing in third and we're paying our quarterback a premium. Listen, I thought the Dak contract years ago was kind of bold. But say this, they don't win in the playoffs, which obviously gets talked about a lot. But every year I'm getting 12 wins with Dak Prescott when he's healthy. Every year I got a pretty good chance to win the division. I've won it two of three years. 
This year might be a little challenging because the roster's not as good because his contract's kicking in. But for three years on that massive contract extension, he answered the bell in the regular season. And I, I just, based on the body of work with Trevor Lawrence, giving him and Tua these massive numbers just seems like bad business because that's ultimately what this is. This is not baseball where you have an unlimited amount of money and you can pay Shohei Otani, you can pay his buddy from Japan who's some sweet pitcher, you can pay Mookie Betts, you can pay Freddie Freeman, you can do like the Yankees did all those years, pay all these guys. It doesn't matter. That's not the case here. You're in a salary cap league where your resources, you better be right. Because when you sign bad contracts or overpay dramatically for a player, it's a problem. And that's a position player. When you dramatically overpay a quarterback, you're in major, major trouble. So I I think these teams, like, yeah, Lamar Jackson and Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes making boatloads of money. They're elite. They're all-time great players. I mean, Patrick Mahomes, you could argue, is already like a top five quarterback of all time. Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson are the second and third best player given Joe Burrow's injuries right now in the league. So, like, you feel good about it. And they they can carry teams. When I pay you all this money, like, you get to a point, like, can you carry me? And I, I haven't seen enough. I mean, we've seen two in these big games, a lot to be desired. Like, just not my type player. Trevor Lawrence kind of still riding a lot of hype from his from his youth. Um, weird situation in Jacksonville, but I just got to see more. And I could not give out that type of money. Now, Justin Jefferson's currently holding out from these voluntary OTAs. He's so good, like you don't have a choice. Like you're going to have to pay him a ton of money. But this is where it gets complicated. The last wide receiver contracts are 70-ish million dollars. Like, that's the most guaranteed money that was given out. He's probably going, I want $100 million. And that's just not how these teams operate. It's all based on comps. Even if your hat is nicer than my hat, if I bought my hat for $30 and you go, hey, I'll sell you this hat, it's a little nicer for $60, that, that becomes difficult. And that's where these conversations just aren't black and white. The Vikings aren't morons. They know how elite this player is. And Jefferson knows, obviously, how good he is. But you start asking for the moon, and that's part of negotiations. One team's, you know, out here, the other team's over here, and and you try to find some middle ground. And clearly, because there's been several years, uh, you know, before that group of guys, Debo, DK, and, and AJ got those big contracts. AJ since has got a contract extension on top of that is that's where the numbers, you know, are just a little weird. And you've seen some other guys get contract extensions. To me, it's less about the per year and more like, how much are you guaranteeing me? So I'm sure he wants a hundred plus million dollars, right? Nick Bosa last year got $125 million, most money ever for a non-quarterback. And we haven't seen a player quite of that level get extended, but like there were already comps for that position. TJ Watt, I think, got over 90. Miles Garrett was in the 100 range. Joey Bosa was in the 100 range. So it's like, yeah, I think I'm better. The position inflation, the cap inflation, it was a bold move on top of the previous numbers, but it wasn't out of the realm. And that's where I wonder if there's some disconnect here. Ultimately, Justin Jefferson will be a Minnesota Viking. Cam Hayward, who's been on this podcast a couple times, This is one that gets kind of complicated because he's an older player. He's holding out. He sees the amount of money these D-tackles are getting. He knows his value to the team, team captain, uh, man of the year for the NFL. And I think the Steelers go, well, you are 35. You were injured last year. These can get very emotional. These are difficult discussions and situations to figure out. Now, ultimately, the closer and closer you get for the season – Like, the one move you have, like, if Tua really wanted to get paid, like, I give him credit because he hangs his hat. I mean, a lot of it is intangibles. Team leader, everyone likes him, knows the offense. You start holding out, I don't blame him. Like, that is the business move. It's what Zach Martin did last year. It's like, Zach, we're paying you 14. Well, I see all these other guards getting 16. I want 20. So he's like, I'm not showing up. 
Like that is your one pitch. Not an easy pitch to throw, but when you throw it, you create a chaotic situation for the organization and put leverage a little bit in your court. So I understand what Cam's doing. That is the right business move. Just fans can turn on you, right? Justin Jefferson, no one's like, that's weird, right? It's like, yeah, shit. He deserves a lot of money. Tua did it. Is he good enough? Is he good enough? But this is where like Tua's in the business of Tua, right? That, that's the business you're in. You, you don't own a company. You, you know, you don't have some other entity. Like your business is you playing quarterback for them. So this is not an easy situation, but we'll see over the next 24 hours any other names pop up. I'm sure there will be. C.D. Lamb would definitely be one to keep an eye on. We are this close to crowning an NBA champ. And with action heating up on the court, it's even hotter at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. There are only so many games left, and DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same-game parlays, live betting, odds boost, and so much more. Don't miss out or you'll have to wait until the next NBA season to place your bets. It's super easy for first-timers to get started. Try betting on something simple, like picking a team to win. Go to DraftKings Sportsbook app, select your squad, and place your first bet. It's that simple. New to DraftKings? Listen up. New customers can get a no-sweat bet up to 1500 bucks. Just deposit at least 5 bucks, and you'll get a bonus bet back equal to your first bet if it doesn't hit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the code JOHN. That's code J-O-H-N for new customers to get a no-sweat bet up to $1,500 if your first bet doesn't hit. Only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. OTAs. Uh, I just want to hit on some things that I think are key going into like this next month period of time. I think first and foremost is all your top picks which ideally are going to contribute to you this season. Your first, second round picks, and then you're going to get a couple random other rookies. But they're really starting probably closer to the third, with the third group than they are with the one. Sometimes your, you know, your rookies, old school coaches will put them with the two. Some just throw them right in. Obviously, some of these quarterbacks, Bo Nix, Caleb Williams, just run it with the ones. You got to mix those guys in. Because they had rookie minicamp. They've been traveling forever. They haven't been with the veteran players. Now you're all under one umbrella. You're all on one team. So this is not about, there's no pads. There's no hitting. There's no tackling. It's about taking the scheme from the coaches and then seeing your new teammates and how to play. And that to me is a huge key because with the injuries, with the amount you have to depend, and I would say the same, the second year guys, some of them, your draft picks that spend time on practice squad, this is a huge time for them to gain an advantage, especially over some of these new rookies. You might have been a guy last year that was drafted in the third round to play guard. And then all of a sudden they draft another guy in the third or fourth round to play guard. You have a huge advantage during this period of time because you know everything, especially if you have the same coach or same coordinator. You have a gigantic, gigantic advantage because of the knowledge, because of what is uh, asked of everybody at practice, the standard of your team. So this is a time for you to separate a little bit. I think, you know, in free agency, when you give a guy a little bit of money, that guy's going to start for you. This is not a young player, a rookie player that you have to at least, you know, get him to earn his stripes, get him to earn the respect of the coaches and the team. If I give a guy $15 million a year at guard or D tackle or linebacker or whatever position, That guy is my starter. So as the tech companies like to say in a a very trendy word, to onboard that guy, wherever you're coming from, this is how we do it here. This is what we want you to do. Now, here's the thing. When you sign a guy in free agency, if he's been in the league four or five, however many years, he's shown you what he does. So now when you sign that guy, you should be asking him to do what he does well. So it's it's kind of a tough balance. Ideally, he's just a plug-and-play scheme fit. If he's not, that's where you get problems with some of these free agency signings. This is not baseball. Hey, I just signed a third baseman. He bats second in my lineup. Put him at third base, put him at second in the lineup, we're off and running. He's either going to hit and play defense or he's not. That's obviously not how football works. 
you know, hey, this guy was more of a press man corner. Now you're asking him to play more, way more zone concepts. This guy played in Kyle's scheme that's all zone-based runs. Now we're doing more one-on-one power base. We're going to ask him to pull a lot. It's like, well, we, we might have some issues. But ultimately, you sign that guy to be the starter. So when the ones come out this week, next week, that guy's running with the ones. And getting him up to speed, the terminology is probably different. It's like, hey, I knew Spanish. You got to learn Chinese now. Even though football, like the plays relatively are going to have a lot of similarities, the verbiage is different. So getting him comfortable, red might have meant one thing there, and now green means what red used to mean, right? I'm just using something pretty rudimentary, but it's really that it can be confusing. And this is a good time to work out any confusing level. And then obviously the team bonding stuff. This is the time of year where if you have teams in the NBA or the NHL, where you see all these guys together at boxes slamming beers, where you see these guys throwing out first pitches at whatever the baseball stadium is all in a box, you know, firing down chicken strips and shotgunning a beer while they're on the jumbotron. Like that shit matters. Ultimately, this is a team game. And to do team bonding stuff, hopefully it just happens organically uh, with your young players, your older players, your new players. I, I do think that's important. It really is. It doesn't make or break you if you're not good enough. But it's pretty clear these teams that win have pretty good cohesion. And that's something that is on the GM because are you picking the right type guys? Have you put a team together of like-minded individuals? Because if you have, they'll get along. And ultimately, for the most part, football teams, a lot of guys get along no matter what. But the closer they can get during this time, especially with new faces, I think the easier transition it is during training camp when it's really hard and long and boring and monotonous and not that fun. So this time of year is much more fun, right? It's like three-day work weeks. You're doing all sorts of shit on the weekend. You get long breaks. Coaches are working, you know, the equivalent for them of nine to fives. Now, the coaches that aren't like Andy Reid or Mike Tomlin or some of these guys, it's a little chiller. If you have a new coach, either a new head coach or new coordinators, it's obviously a little more complicated to implement the scheme, get everyone on the same page. Uh, th- there is more work to be done mentally. And that's where the meetings are really big right? Because you're installing all this stuff. You don't want to install too much, but you don't want to install not enough. You want to make sure they understand it. You don't want to go from A to F when they don't understand B and D. So this is just, it's a cool time for the scouts. They're kind of kicking back, but some of your new position coaches and definitely your coordinators, uh, it's a new time. And obviously all the new head coaches, good time to get your feet under you. You know, this is a good time. You're running the entire team. So when you see a headline, hey, so-and-so got in trouble or so-and-so got injured. Well, if you were the offensive coordinator and it was a defensive guy, that was never your problem. Like Mike McDonald or Brian Callahan with the Titans. When someone on the opposite side of the ball had an issue, they didn't really have to think about it. Pedal to the metal, just focus on what they were focusing on. That comes to your desk now. And you were going to lead the team meeting, you have to deal with something off the field. So just getting a little bit, hell, just a guy having an awful day. A guy who uh, broke up with his girlfriend and is in an awful mental space. These are human beings, young human beings. So these guys better figure it out and better figure it out fast. Uh, Because the season comes, there's no waiting around. It's it's full go. Okay, some other just NFL stories that I kind of found interesting. Michael Rubin, who is the Fanatics... CEO, president, created the company, uh, which has obviously become a powerhouse company when it comes to apparel, has a little bit of a dispute going on with Marvin Harrison Jr. And Marvin Harrison Jr., these guys are claiming that he signed a deal up to a million dollars, and he did not complete his end of the bargain. He didn't do anything. And Marvin Harrison Sr., who scouting buddies told me, he plays a huge role in all this. Like the reason Marvin did nothing during the pre-draft process 
wasn't Marvin's idea. It was Pops. And which is fine. It's not your normal, just like it wouldn't be like my dad if I was an NFL player giving me advice like that. You've never been around the NFL. This guy's a Hall of Famer. But this could is gonna get interesting because I don't think Fanatics, who is very, very dependent on their deals with the leagues, on deals with the players, would just randomly sue. Like, I, I think this is, it's going to be fascinating to watch the way this plays out. Uh, it's not going to impact him on the field, but, you know, Marvin Harrison Sr., man, he, uh, he he's playing a pretty big role in his son's life, which is a good thing, but it can be complicated when business gets involved. Um uh, there was a picture that went viral because Dave Rubin, or not Dave Rubin, Michael Rubin. I think Dave Rubin's a podcaster. Michael Rubin had what he does every year. When these guys do this rookie shoot in Los Angeles, he has over the top rookies, mainly the quarterbacks. I saw Malik Neighbors was there too. And he brings like Tom Brady and Jay-Z. And it's cool. He put out some clips of Tom giving advice, Jay-Z giving advice. They're all around like a, probably a dinner table, not a conference table, because it looked like it was at his house. And there was a picture that kind of went viral that the Patriots posted, that Michael posted, that Drake May posted. Drake May is massive. Tom Brady's huge. I, I think Tom Brady, I've walked around him, feels like he's six foot six. I think technically at the combine, he measured in at like just a shade under six five. He is a huge individual. And Drake may look bigger than him. Obviously, Tom's skinnier now, but Drake may is a massive, massive guy. And this gets back to betting on the quote-unquote intangibles or the tangibles, the size, uh, all that there is to work with. I understood it. I understood it the whole time. And it's going to be, it's going to be fascinating to watch how the Patriots play out with him. Uh, total access. The NFL Network, I've been saying this for a long time, has just mailed it in. Now, there is financial ramifications to this. I, I People often like, the NFL's making money hand over fist. How are they just not trying with the NFL Network? Well, yeah, if one entity makes money, doesn't mean that you necessarily have to keep pumping money into something else that is not making money. I would consider myself, as we said in the radio business, a P1 which is your most loyal radio listeners. And I'm sure we have these now on the podcast, people that listen to all the content. A large percentage of people would be considered more casual. They come in and they come out depending on time, depending on their schedule. Football is my life. It's how I make a living. It's how I support my family. It's how I put food on the table. Uh, I love it. I think about it. I watch it. I never, ever, watch NFL Network, ever. Now, I know Mike Yam, who hosted that show recently. He used to work at Pac-12. He's a stud. It it sucks. There's a large percentage of people that lose their job that aren't making much money. Production assistants, people behind the scenes. But it's been pretty clear for a while that the NFL does not give a shit about this network. Good Morning Football, which I think relative to their other properties was relatively successful in terms of ratings and people watching it and had like legit talent, like Traeger, uh, Kyle Brandt. It's just on hiatus. It's just not going on. And I've said this over and over. I noticed it at the gym. They just reap. They, they were playing today. I was at the gym this morning and I look up and it's Steelers Titans, but not like from the recent years. It was like when Jeff Fisher was the Titans coach which I actually, if I was running the network and we were doing a bunch of cost cutting, just replay games, replay cool games. <laughs> like what, what the hell is it? We own the, we own the inventory and it's pretty clear. That's what NFL network's doing. If you tell me they are not able to unload this network, which is definitely up for debate, that ESPN and some of these companies that they've tried to sell it to have not pulled the trigger. I think you can just run NFL games nonstop. And once the season starts, you can just replay all the games for the weekend, just in order. I mean, just start bright and early Monday morning and just play the crappier games to the good games from Monday till Thursday. And it's pretty clear that's probably what they're going to do. And I, I kind of understand. If people are not watching your network, that means you're not making any money. 
And given that you have high costs and you're paying people, probably losing money. So this is not like some controversial business decision. Now, you could argue, that is it important for NFL to have a network? I would have said 10, 15 years ago for sure. In 2024, I don't think it matters at all. Uh, what else did I want to hit on? Oh, Daniel Jones. You never know. It all matters when you get injured, your recovery time. I saw the 49ers, they do this. Matt Mayoko, longtime beat writer for the Niners, works I think with the team and they put on this big Dwight Clark, uh, like yearly, it's kind of a round table. They have a bunch of famous players come back. Steve Young was there. Alex Smith was there. Purdy, they were all on stage. Dre Greenlaw was also there. And he's like, I just really started walking pretty recently. (laughs) I mean, he was hurt three months ago, torn Achilles. Daniel Jones was hurt relatively early in the season. And he's already participating in seven on sevens, right? Look at Aaron Rodgers. First game of the season. He's going to be ready for OTAs. So there's going to be a ton of pressure on this guy. No one's going to care that last year he tore his ACL. Uh, he can't be as bad as he was last year. Or they got no shot. I, I don't have high hopes, but he's going to be one of the major stories in the NFL all season long. He's the New York Jets or New York Giants starting quarterback. And let's face it, most people think he sucks. Most people think he fleeced the Giants in a contract and just isn't any good. When that is the narrative on your career. You're not any good and you're making a lot of money. If you thought last year was ugly, it'd get even uglier this year. 